So in the last video, we built this nice little scene here, just a couple of tables with 16 different Suzanne heads on it. And we also discussed a little bit about workspaces, specifically the shader workspace, which is this really awesome workspace we use to help take better advantage of Blender's node editor here. So if you missed that video, I recommend go check that out before you watch this one. So let's go ahead and click on this first Suzanne head here. Make sure you are in the Cycles Render Engine here. So we can add a new material to this Suzanne head either directly here in the Node Editor, or we can add one in the Material tab of the Properties panel, which that's what this whole panel over here is. If we click this little plus sign, wherever you see a little plus sign in Blender, that means it, a menu is hiding there. This is just a basic Properties panel dedicated to the Material tab. Of course, if you need to switch this to something else real quick while you're in the Shader Workspace, you can. But in general, we just leave this on the uh, material tab here. Well, let's just go ahead and do it from the node editor. We'll press new. And by default, we start out with the first shader type, diffuse, which of course diffuse, you can sort of think of as basic color control over your material. So if we were to click on this color value and switch this to anything else, such as green here, it will of course make our monkey head green. Actually, if we come over here in our outliner, which whatever is selected in your scene will be highlighted in your outliner here. If we click this little plus sign, you can now see all the stuff belonging to this uh, Suzanne head here. So you can see that under modifiers, it's got a subsurface modifier on it. And it also has this material here. Whereas if we were to take a look at any one of these other Suzanne heads here, notice there's no material on any of them, but there's a material we just added. And if we press our render preview button, we can get a nice example here of what this will actually look like when it renders. Let's go ahead and stop the render preview. And under lights, let's go ahead and turn on quick lights, which changes our background environment to black, as well as setting up a sweet physical based lighting system, which of course stays hidden unless we are render previewing or do an actual render. So now if I were to press the render preview button, we've got a much more dynamic lighting setup going on here, uh, as opposed to just the generic light coming from the uh, generic white background. And so if you're finding that your render previews are taking too long, or you just would like to speed them up, you can of course do so by just dragging the node editor up here, which decreases the size of this window, which is dedicated to being rendered. Or of course you can drag this over here to make this even smaller. So really whatever your preference is or whatever you need to get a proper example. All right, so I'll go ahead and shut that off for now. So we could go ahead and rename this material. We'll just go ahead and call this our diffuse material since we will be working down the line of all of the shader node types. Now there's actually 18 uh, shader nodes, but the first two mix and add are basically just methods used to combine these other 16 shader nodes, which are really what affect our surface volume and displacement, which we'll get into what all that means in a minute. So that's the first shader. That's the diffuse. Let's go ahead and click on this next Suzanne head here. We can press new to create a new material for this Suzanne head. And we can just click this default diffuse node here, press X to delete it. Notice when we do, the object goes black because there's nothing connecting to this material output node, which is the master head node of your cycles materials, which everything has to funnel into one of these three options of this material output for the material you're using to have any effect. And of course, there's nothing going to the surface, so it's just black because it's void of information. So let's double right click here and under shader, let's add a glossy shader. I'll click here. And I'll click on this green socket here, which these little uh, colored circles here are referred to sockets. The sockets on the right side of a node are the out sockets and the sockets on the left side are in because stuff goes in to the left side and stuff goes out from the right side. And these are also color coded, which for the most part lets you know what type of socket can be connected to what other to another socket. Although that's not always the case and we'll talk about that in the future, but we can go ahead and connect this glossy out to this surface in of this material input. As soon as we do, the material output goes, hooray, I have information again about what this material is supposed to be doing and it leaves from being black to now this gray color. Okay, so this window over to the right here, when we turn the render preview off, this just leaves us with an after image of the last render preview. And this is typically really useful to be able to shut this down so 
nothing's trying to be rendered while you're working in your node editor and adjusting settings and things like that. So it's not slowing stuff down. And so we could go ahead and turn that on and then zoom in here on this new monkey head, which we're using the glossy shader on. So the glossy shader, of course, makes everything reflective, metallic. It's the starting point for a lot of metals, chrome, stuff like that. You can control its color, which typically you want to leave that on white because typically the specularity of things is reflecting white light. But we could also change this to something like orange. We'll get an effect like that, which is pretty sweet. Or we could go ahead and set this back to white here. Then, of course, you have this roughness value, which controls how shiny the glossy node will make things. So we could bring this all the way down to zero and it becomes basically like a reflective mirror or just a pure kind of chrome kind of thing here. Or we could just bring up this roughness a tad or bring it up a whole lot and get something that's barely reflecting its environment. OK, so that's the glossy shader. I'll go ahead and turn off my render preview for now. And let's go ahead and rename that to glossy material in the same way we did for our diffuse material where we're just using a single diffuse node there. Let's go ahead and press new with this third monkey head selected here. And let's go ahead and delete this default diffuse node. And whoops, it looks like I accidentally had the output node and the diffuse node selected at the same time. So when I press X, it deleted all of it, but no worries. We can add another material output. So under output, just select material output. That gives us an output. And let's double right click or press shift A to bring up your add menu. And under shader, let's add a transparent shader node because that's what's next. So the transparent shader node does what you would imagine it to. It makes things invisible. So if we connect its output socket to the input surface socket of the material output, then press our render preview button here. Our third Suzanne head has done a vanishing act it has disappeared from the scene. Unless you just want something to be totally invisible, using the transparency node on its own is not super useful. So what we're going to do is mix this transparency node with another shader node so we can see a little better how it's used. So I'll press my render preview button to stop that. And I'll just drag this over here. And let's mix this with a diffuse shader, which of course gives us sort of a basic color. I'll just set this here. And then I'll add a mix shader and I'll just drag this mix shader on top of this link, which that's what the lines between the nodes are called. They're called links. And if you see it highlight, that means you can drop the node that you have held directly over that link and it will automatically plug up where it needs to be plugged, which is sweet. So right now we've got this transparency node connected to this first shader input we can go ahead and connect this diffuse node to this second one. And right now this factor value controls which node input will be more dominant. And I can go ahead and drop that under this one so those aren't crossed, which doesn't really matter. It's not like it's Ghostbusters and it's gonna like mess something up because you cross the streams. But okay, so now if we press render preview, we are getting a ghostly image because half of it is transparent and half of it is this white diffuse color. But we could go ahead and change this diffuse to say red or something. And if we rotate the camera around here, notice that we can see through this, you can see a bit of the chrome material we we're using coming out the back side here. This factor value is controlling who's getting the lion's share of these nodes. So if I were to drag this all the way to the left here, all the power is going into this first transparent node. So it basically goes invisible. Or if I were to drag this much farther to the right, it decreases the transparency because it's giving all the power to the diffuse. We also have a color option on this transparent value, so we could make this blue or something. So now we get a sort of sweet kind of mix of this transparent node and this diffuse node. Let's go ahead and drop this a little more to where things are more transparent than not. All right, I'll go ahead and turn off my render preview there. Let's go ahead and follow along with what we've been doing so far, which is naming each of these materials after the shader node we're studying. So we got the diffuse material, the glossy material, and we'll call this one transparent material. Moving on, let's click on the fourth Suzanne head. We'll go ahead and press new there. Go ahead and this time make sure we just have this diffuse node selected and not the material output or otherwise it'll delete everything when we press X, just tap X there. So next in line, 
I double right click here, we have the refraction node. The refraction node is almost identical to the glass node, as we'll see here in a minute, except for the refraction node does not use shininess. So if I go ahead and select that and plug up this refraction node to the surface of this material output here, and we press render preview again. Notice this new fourth Suzanne head is looking very glass-like, only it doesn't have any bit of shininess on it. Rather than creating some sort of weird non-reflective glass, this ends up being a useful shader node for affecting volume systems, basically gassy, ethereal, kind of foggy stuff that you maybe you want to have some light bending properties, sort of like if there's a gas leak in a room that's really bad and you can kind of see there's some bending of light going on there and stuff like that. So we have this roughness value, which we can increase. But you can see that blurring those hard black lines there around the material. And then the IOR, which is index of refraction, which controls the bending of light there. So we could, you know, lower this or increase it a bunch. And you can see those effects there. Okay, so let's turn off the render preview. We'll go ahead and call this one refraction material. Moving down the line, let's press new. Let's select this diffuse, X delete, and let's add glass. So glass pretty much does what you would expect it to. Glass is glass. So when we connect glass to the surface here and we press our render preview button, you can see how the glass material when compared with the refraction material are almost exactly the same. Only with the actual glass, you get a shininess similar to what's produced from the glossy node. So typically the glass node is what you want for making glass things. So we've got the same kind of values. We can increase the roughness just a hair, change the index of refraction, which is adjust the way the light bends within the glass. Go ahead and drop this to 1.25. And also we have this color value, which we can change to blue or red or whatever. And when we give that a little bit of time to render, we can see the sweet light from that red glass coming through, hitting the table there, which is pretty cool. Play with this IOR value a little bit here. All right, let's go ahead and turn off our render preview for now. And let's call this glass material. So moving on. Let's click this next Suzanne head, press new to give it a new material. Select just the diffuse node so that the material doesn't get deleted when we press X, press X. And then let's add a translucent node. So from what I understand about the translucent node, it works similarly to the transparency node, only it will only allow light in from one side of the mesh. So if I connect this to the surface here and we press our render preview button, here is the Suzanne head using this translucent. And as you can see, the kind of effect it produces is similar to subsurface scattering, which subsurface scattering is when light is able to enter into a surface, get bounced around, and then come back out. So it, it's good for replicating effects of flesh, milk, eggs, anything organic typically where light doesn't just hit it like it would a hard surface and immediately bounce off, but it hits it, gets absorbed a little bit, and then comes back out. But let's see what happens when we combine the translucent node with an actual transparency node. So I'm gonna press my render preview button and drag this up a little bit. And this time, rather than using a mix shader, which allows us to control which node has the most effect, we can use an add shader, which will just directly combine two nodes and not give us the control of the mix shader. So if I drag this over this link and click, it will automatically snap and move this over. By the way, if you don't want things to be automatically pushed over, you can click this button off to disable that. So let's hook up a transparent node to combine it with this translucent node and see what kind of effects we get there. Strangely, it seems to be emitting light in a, in a kind of a weird way. So what if we bring down the color value of this transparency node? Seems to be turning down that light casting effect that it was having. Let's try changing this translucent color as well. That's a pretty interesting effect. I'll go ahead and turn my render preview off. Let's go ahead and rename this to translucent material and moving on let's select this next Suzanne head and go ahead and press new material let's delete this diffuse shader 
And moving down the line, we have anisotropic. So we can click this and plug this up to the surface. The anisotropic shader is similar to the glossy shader over here, which creates a mirror reflective kind of surface, only it compresses the reflection into specific directions. So that can either be vertically or horizontally. And it's commonly used in things like scratched metals and surfaces like that. If we go ahead and press render preview over here, here's our Suzanne head connected to this anisotropic shader. And as we can see, it's very similar to the glossy shader. Only the reflected light coming off of this material is being bent along a specific axis. As you can imagine, it could be really useful for creating different types of pressed steel and metals and things like that. So we've got this roughness value, which is similar to the glossy nodes roughness. So if we bring that all the way down, it's going to make this super, super shiny. And if we bring it up, it's going to blend the reflectivity a little bit. Then we have the actual anisotropy value, which is, of course, the whole point of the node, which controls the compression that's happening with the light. So the bending of the light there. So if we set this to zero, we now have basically just a glossy node. So it's basically the, the same thing uh, if you have this value here set to zero. So you can think of this as the squeezing or the pressure of the light. If we increase that up a bunch, you can see the light there bunching up more and more. And then of course, down here we have rotation, which controls the direction of the compression. So if I slowly kind of change this, you can kind of see the direction moving there in the render preview window. And so now it's kind of coming down at a diagonal angle like that rather than straight left to right as it was a second ago. So we could decrease that some maybe and what have you. So like I said, this ends up being really awesome for creating pressed steel, scratched kind of metals and stuff like that, which of course you can use texture nodes to plug in through the color as well as the displacement of the material output. And we'll get into that in a little bit to you know, work with this anisotropic node and make even more sweet metallic effects. So I'll go ahead and press my render preview button to turn that off. And let's go ahead and rename this to anisotropic material. So backing out here, so we've now got to the last Suzanne head on this table. So let's click on that, go ahead and press new. And let's ghost to this diffuse node here and add a velvet node here and go ahead and connect it up to the surface as we've been doing with all these other shaders because that's mostly what they connect to is the surface of the material. Velvet nodes are definitely intended to be used in conjunction with other nodes. So the velvet node produces a lighting effect similar to that of velvet, but it's not going to make your object look like it's got velvet strands on it basically. So if we go ahead and press our render preview button, and zoom in on this last Suzanne head here where we've got this velvet shader node. You can see this extra darkness here showing up around the crevices and edges with this velvet node applied, which imitates the effect of fabric like velvet or velvet similar fabric. But of course, to actually get anything kind of bumpy or looking tactile, like you could touch it, we'd have to work with other nodes and this displacement input as well. But we could change this color to something more velvety like this. And right away, it starts looking a bit closer. Lighting within your materials plays a huge role in what the overall effect will be. So the next part of setting up this material with these nodes would be creating something to make the actual surface here and not just the lighting look velvety, but uh, it's a good starting place for fabrics and things like that. Then you have the sigma value, which controls the darkness area. So if you drag that down, notice it's getting darker and darker, getting a kind of a richer, fuller look there and pretty sweet. All right, so that's that. Let's go ahead and rename this to velvet material. And moving down the line, let's reset like a typewriter here and come back to the beginning of the second row. Click that we'll go ahead and press new. Click on this diffuse shader, X to delete, and let's add a tune a shader. Go ahead and connect this to the surface as we do with most shader nodes. So the tune shader node is not one that I use very often. It's mostly if you plan on creating like cell shaded looking animation, but I'm sure some clever people have come up with fancy ways to use this in conjunction with other nodes to produce realistic effects for different types of materials. 
But in general, it's for converting the shading to look more like a cell shaded type animation deal. So if we were to like, say, change this color to something vaguely skinnish, let's click this HSV so we can drop that saturation down. Maybe make this a bit darker. So something like this. And we would press our render preview button here. You can see how the dark shaded areas are homogenized to give this more the appearance that it's less being fully shaded like a computer would and more just using a simple base amount of colors more like an, it would be in an animation. So we can control the size value here, which increases and decreases the underside of the shading there, the smooth value, which controls the lines where the darkness and the color bit meet. So we could increase this. Of course, the more we increase this smoothness value, the less cell shaded it looks and the more 3D rendered it looks. Okay, so we'll go ahead and turn that render preview off. Let's change this to the name to Tune Material. And coming down the line, let's press New and get rid of this basic diffuse here. And under Shader, let's add a subsurface scattering. We'll go ahead and connect that to the surface there. So I mentioned earlier that the translucent uh, shader node was producing a similar effect to subsurface scattering. So you actually have a subsurface scattering node that we can use. And of course, this produces the effect of light getting trapped into something, bouncing around a bit, and then coming back out, as is the case with organic things, plants, skin, milk, a lot of food, stuff like that. Let's go ahead and click on this Suzanne head we were using with the tune material. Let's copy this color value here. I'm going to click on where it says hex and just click this and press Control C. And that lets me copy that value directly. If I was just copying it from node to node, I could click here and just drag it over. But since we're on a different material there, I'll have to do it this way. Click on that and let's, under that hex value, click on that, press Control V to repaste that. So now we've got the same skin color, but this time we're using subsurface scattering. So let's go ahead and press our render preview button over here. And so here we can see the subsurface scattering node using this color here to create a very sort of organic looking type skin. We have scale value, which the scale value controls how deep the light is supposed to hit this object before it's sent back out. So we could lower this way down to say 0 0.05. And so a minute ago when this value was much higher, it was looking much more gelatinous. It looked more like a fake plaster cast of uh, human flesh as opposed to actual skin. And that's because real skin isn't very thick beneath the skin before you start getting to more thicker materials like muscle and bone and stuff like that. So lowering this setting tells the material, hey, only let light come in a little bit, like the distance of skin and maybe a little bit of subcutaneous fat or something, then push it back out. Don't let that light bounce around as though it were six inches thick of like jello or something. And so we get a much more closer to skin result with this subsurface scattering node when we drop this value down real low. This radius value lets us control some additional tinting of this subsurface scattering node. So this is the red, green, and blue. If we were to drop this radius value here of the red all the way down, then we'll have this red pass of light going all the way through this subsurface scattering node here, which maybe that's what you're going for. You're trying to imitate the flow of blood or something under skin. So you might you know, have this down just a little bit. And so you'll have that additional red tint flooding through your subsurface scattering node there. And then we have texture blur, which will blur the effects of the subsurface scattering with whatever texture you happen to have plugged into there, which we don't have anything right now, but definitely something you'll want to use when creating a more complex material. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn off render preview and let's rename this to subsurface scattering material and move on down to this next Suzanne head. Go ahead and press new, get rid of this diffuse under shader here. Let's add emission. Go ahead and drop that down, plug it up to the surface. So emission, as we talked about in a previous video, it just simply means glow or light. This is going to turn the material into a thing that casts light. So if I were to press render preview now, we can see this material is creating light. Of course, we can change the color or we could plug up different textures or images through this color node and then have the color be blasting in all kinds of ways. We can increase the strength, say something high like 15. 
and now I can see this thing blasting all around. Uh, we could turn off the render preview for a second and under lights, under scene brightness, we could drop this down, but you can't really see the effects while in cycles mode until you're render previewing or doing actual render. We could drop this real low and then press render preview. So now most of the light in the scene is just coming from this Suzanne head with this material using this emission shader node there. So this one's pretty straightforward, pretty cool. All right, let's press render preview there. And under lights, I'll go ahead and bring this back up. And let's go ahead and rename this to emission material. And we're almost done here, just a few more. Okay, so if we click on the next Suzanne head, go ahead and press new to give it a new material and get rid of this diffuse default shader node here. Double right click or press shift A to add. And so next we have this hair shader node. And this is for when you're using particle systems to create hair. I don't want to really want to spend too much time talking about particle systems and stuff today, but if we go ahead and switch this from shader back to blender and with this fourth monkey head selected here, what we can do is use the zero brush particle edit menu to quickly generate some particle hair for us to use for this example. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on that. And this will create a default particle system for me. And I'm gonna go ahead and press full screen. And so what I could do is just immediately start putting a little bit of hair on the Suzanne head, just start painting it on there. Okay. Then I could press space to bring up my brush selection and select length and just increase this. Something like that. And then press space to bring up my brush selection and select comb. And I'm just going to pull this over the top of the head here so we have a little bit of an example to use. And we'll be getting a lot more into zero brush and using these features in the future. But for now, I just want a something quick that we can use to discuss this hair shader node. Okay, nothing too fancy, that'll do. Notice over here, and this is the latest version of Zero Brush and Zero Brush Lite, we have these layer options while we're in particle edit mode. And what this allows us to do is quickly add a material to the selected particle layer, which is currently this hair we're working on right now. It allows us to select any material from the entire file to use on this layer or add a basic hair material. If you're in Blender Render, it will set up the material for Blender Render stuff. If you're in Cycles, it will create a basic Cycles hair material. And this is really useful because by default, if you want to get a material to be associated with a particle system, such as this hair, you have to first add that material to the object. Then you have to go into the particle settings over here in the properties panel here and manually select this from materials that exist on the object. A zero brush makes this super easy by allowing you to just directly choose any material that exists in the whole file or add a basic one. So what we're going to do is just simply press this add basic material and this generates a basic hair cycles material for the hair we just added there. Let me comb that hair. It looks like it got stuck, <laughs> stuck inside of its face. Let's uh, change this to cut and cut that off there. There we go. And it also lets us quickly adjust the color for any hair layer that we create, which is pretty sweet. So we just change the color to whatever we want there. And whatever we want there, press apply color and it's done. But I'll go ahead and switch that back to some kind of nice brown type deal. Seems like I always need to turn the saturation down some too. press apply color. All right. Okay, so that sets us up with a quick example so we can take a look at this hair node. Okay, so back over in shader, notice here over in our materials that the actual hair material that was created is this Suzanne.002 hair. And the current material we deleted the diffuse for, which was stupid because we need that to show the head part of the monkey as opposed to the hair material. So let's go ahead and add a diffuse, which is just basic color shader on there, maybe make that, I don't know, maybe he's like pink or something. And here's the actual hair material that was generated. Okay, so to get to that, all I have to do is press my little magnifying glass here, which will zoom in on the entire node setup within the node editor. If you happen to be, you know, you got lost from it somehow, or the blender just put you in some weird place, 
And here is this very simple hair setup, which is just this shader hair node connected to this material output here. So now if we press our render preview button, we can zoom in on this little bit of hair we created. So the hair shader node just gives us a basic way to create good looking material for our hair particles. The options here, we have reflection. This means that this node will be dedicated to reflection of the hair, but you also have transmission, which basically controls uh, how much light will be passing through the hair. So sort of a kind of translucency, transparency feature. If you're wanting to make anything very advanced, you would probably want to mix these two. So you could add a mix shader here and add one hair node there. And then we could just press D to duplicate this. Or of course you can just, you know, add it from the menu uh, if you want. And you would have this one set to transmission, this one set to reflection, and use some mix of these two. And so we could press the render preview button here and maybe have this more towards reflection than transmission but you know, pretty much all up to you. Then down here, of course, you have the color. We can make this, you know, whatever you want. You can also control this value directly from the particle layers menu in zero brush when you are using the particle edit mode, that's the little comb. And then you have offset, which controls the, the rotation of that shiny bit, that shiny sheen bit of the hair. So if we go ahead and pull this all the way up towards the reflection, we give the reflection total control. We could change these degrees here. And it's kind of hard to see because we've got this uh, other emission material on this monkey over here, shining light onto it, which is you know, a little misleading, but you can see where the reflection was going along right along here. It's now been turned more diagonal across here. Also, if we decrease this roughness, which the roughness controls, how shiny the shiny parts are. So we can drop that all the way down and adjust this offset again and get you know an effect like this. Okay, so let's press render preview, turn that off. Let's go ahead and call this hair material since that's what it is. We're backing out of here. We've just got four left. Let's click on this next one. Go ahead and press new, give this a new material. I'll press my little handy dandy node finder thing and get zoomed back in on here. Let's click on this diffuse, press X to delete it, and go ahead and ambient occlusion node. So ambient occlusion in Blender Render is an effect you use scene wide, whereas ambient occlusion within cycles is something that you either have connected to a specific cycles material or not, and it's not a scene wide thing that you can just automatically apply to everything. But it does the same basic thing. It just increases the amount of shadows and shading bouncing off of areas that are closer together, which is kind of weird because sort of the entire cycles engine is the effect of ambient occlusion. I mean, it, it does that by default. So for instance, this object here has no material. And if we press render preview here, we get the basic shading and shadow effects that would require us to use ambient occlusion if we were in Blender Render. But there is this ambient occlusion node if we want to make those effects more intense, I guess. So we could click back on this, connect this to the surface, which it was black because it had no information. It was not connected to anything. And we could change this color to black like this and then press our render preview button. Zoom in on this and maybe not make this quite so black, maybe increase this some. And you can see how we can additionally affect the, the shading via that ambient occlusion node. All right, so let's turn that off and rename this. Let's just call it AO for short, AO material. And click on this next Suzanne head, press new. Get rid of this default diffuse shader. And let's add a holdout shader, which holdout is not really so much of a shader as it is a shader effect. This will make whatever object is using the material turn invisible if you have use transparent turned on to where you won't be rendering your background and say you just want to save out the background as a transparent PNG. This will make whatever it happens to be using it also transparent. So if we connect this to the surface here, if we press render preview right now, this will just look black. The holdout will make things look black. But if under here, under output options, we select use transparent, and then we were to actually render this little scene out. So I could press render here, and we have these render sample settings set 
it's super low, I think to just 25 or so. But notice how the object with the material where we're using the holdout node shader does not get rendered. So it's just like it basically got stamped out, which might be kind of cool. You might have a need for that. So we could actually save this image as a PNG right now. And we'd have that nice transparent background to use in for whatever we needed a transparent background for. So I'll press go back here and let's go ahead and rename this to holdout material. And let's click on this next to last Suzanne head. Let's go ahead and press new and ghost this diffuse node and add a volume absorption node. So up until now, we've been dealing totally with the surface aspect of material output. But volume nodes, which there are two volume shader nodes, we can use with the volume settings. So up until now, all the effects on these different materials have been all about what does the outside surface of this object look like? Whereas volume, uh, we can use to make cloudy, kind of gas, ethereal, kind of foggy type stuff where you're dealing with everything affecting the way the material looks all the way through and through. So with this one, we connect it to the volume socket of the material output. But let's go ahead and change its color too so we can get a better idea of what's going on with it. Something like this. And notice that the node appears black because we don't have anything connected to its surface. But if we press render preview now, you can see the Suzanne head with this very simple volume material on it looks like a ghosty cloudy type deal. But you could also combine this effects with other surface stuff. So we could have a glossy material connected to the surface. So this would be like a weird shiny outward thing with a foggy inward thing, or you could use a glass shader you could combine with the surface. So maybe it was some kind of murky weird glass or something. And we can use this density value to control how dense that volume is in there or not like this pretty easily. Okay, so let's turn that off. Let's go ahead and rename this to, we'll shorten it to vol absorption material. And finally to the last Suzanne head, let's go ahead and press new. So let's go ahead and select this diffuse node, press X, delete it, and finally add a volume scatter. So the volume scatter is going to be your go-to volume node for clouds, mist, fog, and stuff like that. So we just click and drag this to volume here. So here we have density control similar to the volume absorption, uh, but we also have a, a, an isotropy, which if I drag this out, you can see the word a little better, control, which also has to do with the bending and compression of light as we learned with the anisotropic node shader, which is cool for like doing sweet metal effects and such. So we could change this color to maybe some other kind of teal or something like that, who knows? And press our render preview button. Here you can see, whereas with the volume absorption, we're getting a much more uniform controlled effect with the volume scatter. It's much more ethereal and dispersed. So it'd be much easier to make simple shapes and apply this and use it for clouds and fog and stuff like that. So we have the density control, which we could increase. And this is volume scatter, so it's taking in light, mostly light probably coming from that red velvet material we created and the rest of the scene, and it's scattering it around too. Then we add the, uh, an isotropy value, which is going to be kind of hard to see unless we let this render out for a while. But we could change this color and get all kinds of different effects here. Of course, with white, this appears a lot more like some kind of fog or smoke or something. We could drop this density value down real low and what have you. And a video soon to come, we'll be going over these texture nodes and how to mix them and weave them in and out of these shader nodes to create amazing things. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for more.